Okay, I think we're live on Facebook at the moment. Sorry for the delay. Sorry for the delay. Oops. Okay. All right, let's get back to Zoom here. Okay, so we have about 31 participants out of 40, which I think is good to go. Um, welcome to those of you that are joining us. Thank you so much for um, signing up. Um, welcome virtually to the University of Southern Mississippi Marine Education Center. Um, we're located in Ocean Springs, Mississippi. If you haven't been to us, uh, we have a state-of-the-art education facility adjacent to the Mississippi Sound. And uh, throughout the year, we host school groups, um, teachers and their students for field trips and overnight camps. We also do teacher workshops, professional development, and usually uh, summer camps. Um, due to the global pandemic, we will not be offering in-person summer camps this year for the first time in over 30 years, but we do have some really exciting things coming up about virtual our virtual summer camp presence. So stick around uh, for the end of the lecture if you want to hear more about that. Um, so we're going to continue at this point during this uh, COVID to uh, pandemic to bring you virtual content and we're really excited to do that. Um, so today is copepods. We're gonna uh, learn a little bit about them. We have our two speakers here, Lacey Essery. She is a marine educator at the Marine Education Center. And we also have Dr. Reg Blaylock joining us um, who is a university professor. Um, we're, Lacey's going to tell us a little bit about what copepods are and some backgrounds and some facts on those. And Dr. Blaylock is going to tell us how they relate to his research. Um, so each, uh, Lacey's going to go first. During the presentation, um, look at your Zoom account and look at the bottom. There's a Q&A button. So while Lacey is speaking, if you have any questions for her, go ahead and jot those down in the Q&A. And after Lacey is finished speaking, we're going to answer some questions for you. And then Dr. Blakelock will begin. So we've got some exciting facts about copepods for you today. We're going to hear from Lacey. Like I said, she is a marine educator at our facility. She's been with us about a year. Uh, she's a Mississippi native. She graduated from USM with a degree in marine biology. She loves teaching, especially about marine things, marine life, marine biology. You might have seen her if you've been to the MEC, uh, and you've also might have seen her virtually uh, during our Penny for Your Thoughts series, which is actually really funny and fun and educational. If you haven't checked it out, please do so. Lacey actually came up with a name for Penny for Your Thoughts, so... We owe her a lot. <laughs> so uh, let's get started. Lacey, tell us a little bit about copepods. You've got the floor. All right, so I am going to share my screen to you guys. Um, Megan, can you make it to where I can share my screen, please? Uh, okay. I'm going to share my PowerPoint. And throughout this PowerPoint, I've got some pop quiz questions. So if you guys wanna type those answers in Q&A, please do. Um, or if you just want to type it in the chat, go ahead and do that. And if you're live on Facebook, go ahead and put those answers in the comments just so we can get some participation. They're not hard questions. They're really, really fun. Um, but as soon as I share my screen, you will um, get to see all that stuff, fun stuff. Okay. So I've made you a co-host. You should be able to share that. Do you okay. now? I'm getting it. All right. So how does that look? Can you see just my PowerPoint? All right. Wonderful. So this is my lesson entitled Copepods in the Classroom. So we'll get started. Let me do this, all right. So first things first, what the heck is a copepod? I never really knew um, what they were until I started going to school and learning um, more in depth about you know, marine biology. But 
First things first, a copepod is a type of zooplankton. And so a zooplankton is a small animal-like plankton that dominates the planktonic world. So to help you better understand, the opposite of a zooplankton is going to be a phytoplankton, which are plant-like plankton that produce about half of the world's oxygen through a process called photosynthesis, just like the plants do on land. They also produce oxygen. So not only are they zooplankton, but they are holoplankton as well. So holoplankton means that they are microscopic in size for their entire life. So you're never going to be able to see these guys without using some type of special equipment like a microscope. Um, so again, the opposite of a holoplankton is going to be a meroplankton. And at the beginning of their life, they are planktonic, but they will grow to be large animals that we can see with our naked eyes, kind of like a blue crab. Blue crabs start out at very, very small stages in their life. Um, and they will grow to be larger animals that you can see just walking down the beach. So copepods are actually very diverse. There are over 13,000 known species in both marine and freshwater environments. There are actually about 2,800 species of copepods that live in fresh water. So copepods can be found globally and are thought to be the most abundant aquatic animals on the earth. So if you try and put that into perspective, it'll blow your mind a little bit. Um, so we'll go through the taxonomy very briefly just to kind of um, help you understand where they fall in the animal kingdom. So like I said, they are uh, kingdom animalia and they're in the phylum arthropoda. So that means they're going to be in the same phylum as all of the insects. Um, they're in subphylum crustacea, which means they are related to lobsters and crabs. Uh, they're in the class maxillopoda and subclass copepod. So there's that name copepod. And then within the subclass copepods, there are about 10 orders of copepods. And within those 10 orders falls the 13,000 known species of copepods. So now let's talk about the life cycle of a copepod. So copepods have a short lifespan due to being holoplankton and their development may take up to a year depending on their species. Now copepods will hatch from small eggs that float throughout the water column where they are then called nauplii. So they are nauplii for at least half of their life and will molt about five or six times and are then classified as juveniles or copepodites. Um, they will molt five to six more times until they are large sexually mature adults and um, adults do not molt and they will simply reproduce and then the cycle will begin all over again. So this is a visual of the life cycle of a copepod. Um, so over here on the left starts out um, as an egg, obviously hatches into that nauplii stage with six different nauplier stages. And then that will molt and grow into the six copepodite stages where molting will occur um, all throughout these six stages. And then there's a new step that I did not talk about on the last slide. So this step right here is called diapause. So diapause is a type of dormancy and it comes either in anticipation of or in response to changes in their environment. And there is a period of rest before development can proceed. So diapause is characterized by reduced growth, development and activity. So they are essentially paused in their development until those conditions are right, such as um, water temperature, salinity, quality of water that um, these copepods need to continue. And then after that diapause stage, we have the last stage of a uh, mature adult where that cycle will just start all over again. So now let's talk about copepods in the food web. So copepods are like the glue that hold the food web together. In fact, they eat so much phytoplankton, remember those are gonna be plant-like plankton, that they have been called cows of the sea, just like how cows graze green pastures. So there you go, Megan, cows of the sea. Um, <laughs> cute little nickname for them. But they are important food items for lots of animals, large and small, such as fish larvae and filter feeders like whale sharks and different types of baleen whales. Um, Copepods eat phytoplankton and they themselves are food for fish. So since they are an important part of the marine food web, they are a good indicator of the state of the marine environment. Um, for example, following an oil spill, copepods have been known to eat and filter tiny oil droplets from the water. And this is going to be used for monitoring the environmental consequences of events like that. All right, here's a pop quiz. So if you can think of your answer, you can type it in the Q&A. Um, but 
let's name something that copepods graze on based on a food web in the previous slide. So I'll give you guys probably five or six seconds to try and think of it and then I'll move on with the answer. Type your answer into the Q&A and let's see what we've come up with. All right, I think you guys have had enough time. So the answer is going to be phytoplankton. Copepods will graze on phytoplankton. They are in fact major grazers of phytoplankton and help control huge phytoplankton blooms. So phytoplankton can bloom similar to plants um, in these mass quantities that can sometimes be seen from space. And this is just a great food source for all these copepods. So copepods graze on phytoplankton. Yes, we have a correct answer. We also have diatoms and algae. Nice. All right, so moving on to copepods in aquaculture. So why are copepods important in the first place? So beginning in the larval stages, fish hunt and consume copepods as copepods are filled with um, nutrients for larval fishes. Even species who do not grow to be too big continue to feed on copepods for the remainder of their life. So seafood is a major food source throughout the world and with overfishing, we are actually at risk of losing that um, source and alternate food sources are going to be essential. So with all forms of aquaculture in play, we can help wild populations of fish as we continue to raise awareness of the risks of overfishing. It is actually predicted that by the year 2030, 62% of all seafood produced for human consumption will come from an aquaculture setting. Today, that percentage is about 50%. Um, in fact, fish bred and raised in aquaculture settings are going to need a food source as well. So where do copepods come into play here? All right, so now let's talk about some strictly aquaculture. So first things first, what is aquaculture? So I come from a very agriculture heavy town. Um, I did not know a lot about aquaculture until I began my college career of um, learning about marine biology, but my little trick is think about agriculture and how it's farming on the land. Aquaculture is essentially farming in the water. So um, aquaculture is the breeding, rearing, and harvesting of fish, shellfish, algae, and other organisms in all types of water environments. But why is aquaculture important? So for two reasons, they are important environmentally and economically. So environmentally, aquaculture is important because it restores habitat, replenishes wild fish stocks of fish and other animals. It rebuilds wild populations of threatened and endangered species in a marine or freshwater environment. And so economically, aquaculture is important because it is a great method to produce food and other commercial products to keep up with the growing demand in commercial fisheries. So aquaculture is economically, environmentally, and socially sustainable. In the 2013 census of aquaculture, sales were actually estimated at $1.37 billion. So as you can see in this image on the right over here, aquaculture can be done on land with pools or in open waters using things called net pans, which are in the ocean, or ponds for freshwater processes. But how exactly does all of this work? So copepods in aquaculture. Copepods continue, uh, contribute to the natural diet of most marine fish larvae. So early larval fish feed off nauplii that are small in size and have great nutrient content. However, the use of copepods as larval feeds is limited by the inability to consistently produce them in large numbers to support a large scale fish production. So um, in a study done at TC Max, scientists were able to predict daily output for live feedings. So Dr. Blaylock, who is on this call and will be speaking today, um, and his associates um, produced a study about the grow out of a certain species of copepod. So this um, a continuous production of copepods um, is very important. And this certain species of copepod is significant for marine larviculture because um, the small size of its first and second nauplii, which is going to be the first two times that baby copepods molt, um, is compatible with mouth sizes of some of the smallest fish larvae, but they do tend to molt out of these stages very quickly. So those eggs must be hatched every day. So the species that we're talking about, um, Aetonsa is what I'm gonna call them. Um, adult Aetonsa are gonna be placed in tanks where they produce eggs that are then separated from the culture, hatched and grown to the appropriate size for feeding fish or restocking the adult culture. 
So this copepod production system actually produced on average 22 million eggs and 11 million nauplii, which is this 49 uh, rate of hatch rate of 49% you see right here on the slide. So hatching of the eggs generated enough nauplii to support the initial feeding of 120,000 larvae of red snapper. Think about that number for a second. That's a lot of little baby red snapper to support um, commercial fisheries and wild stocks. So copepods and aquaculture play a huge role and are extremely important. So I want to talk about the Thad Cochran Marine Aquaculture Center for a little bit. From here on out, I'm gonna call it TC Mac because that's a, it's a mouthful. Um, so at TC Mac, they are conducting research to alleviate bottlenecks. So a bottleneck is a sharp reduction in the size of a population due to the environmental events or human activities. Um, so environmental events are going to be things such as hurricanes and then uh, human activities that could create a bottleneck would be something like an oil spill. So the image on the right actually demonstrates this. So this little guy in the top left. Um, so in the bottle, this represents your original populations. So your orange spheres, your green and your red spheres represent different species. And then you can see where the bottle tapers off and the opening becomes smaller. That is gonna represent a bottlenecking event that makes um, a species population um, difficult to bounce back from an event like this. So it's very, very small. It's hard to get through if you think of it like that. And so only a few types of um, species, not a lot of the population of a certain species will make it through that bottlenecking event. And so in the glass, um, you can see that we have very few orange and green spheres and we have no red spheres left over. So a bottlenecking event eliminated our red sphere um, species. So um, the consequences of a drastic bottlenecking event would be a decrease in genetic diversity. So with a smaller population, they are gonna have smaller genetic diversity. So they remain to pass on genes to future generations, but the chances of inbreeding can also increase, which leads to a decrease in population fitness or its ability to survive. So to feed and support the species that they culture, they produce algae, rotifers, and copepods in support of these culture operations. And then they culture species such as shrimp, snapper, spotted sea trout, blue crab, striped bass, and cobia, which are all used to support the commercial fisheries industry. So this is the quiz time. This is where you show what you know. And again, please use the Q&A or the um, comments to drop your answers, see if you get anything right, which I know you will because you're very smart. All right, so first question, how many species of copepods are there? A, 300, B, 1,700, C, 10,000, or D, 13,000. So I'll give you guys a couple seconds to drop your uh, answers. All right, so the answer to how many species of copepods are there, you had to think back to the very beginning of this presentation. This answer is going to be D, 13,000. There are 13,000 known species of copepods with about 2,800 of them living in freshwater environments. So rivers, lakes, ponds, stuff like that. All right, next question is a true or false. So true or false, copepods will stay in the nauplii stage for at least half of their life. Give you guys a couple seconds. <laughs> So the images on the bottom right here are going to be um, real life images of copepods in their nauplii stage. Um, I believe they're gonna be in different like molting stages. So it's pretty neat to have um, an image of that. But the answer to this question is going to be true. Copepods will stay in the nauplii stage for at least half of their life. So if you think back to that visual of the um, life cycle, you remember those six different stages of nauplii where they were molt will molt and then there are six different stages of a copepodite or that juvenile stage where they will molt. All right, so last question. Um, what type of animals consume exclusively copepods and other plankton? So is it A, omnivores, B, planktivores, C, carnivores, or D, herbivores? So kind of use your context clues for this question, but I'll give you guys a couple of seconds.
All right. The answer to that is going to be B, planktivores. So planktivores are obviously going to consume plankton. It's right in the name. You know, obviously omnivores consume plants and animals, carnivores consume meat, and then herbivores are strictly plant-based. Um, so there's actually a bonus question to this, and I want you guys to try and name at least three planktivores. Again, you can drop them in the comments or the Q&A section, and then I will give you my three planktivores that I think are the coolest things in the world. Okay, let's see what we got. Three planktivores. Let's see who's got it. <laughs> All right, so my three planktivores. The first one is a basking shark. So this is a basking shark. It is the second largest fish in the world, the first being the whale shark. So basking sharks live in temperate waters around the world, and their name actually comes from the fact that they look like they're basking on the surface while they're feeding because they will swim right at the surface of the water, and it looks like they're just basking in the sun. Um, these guys are kind of rare, but since their range is temperate waters, they can be found in a few places. It's just lucky to get to see one. All right, so my second one is going to be a blue whale. So this is a type of um, baleen whale that I was discussing. Um, it's actually the largest animal on the planet. It is actually longer than three school buses and pretty much everything about the blue whale is huge, massive. So its tongue weighs as much as an elephant. Its heart is the size of a car and its blood vessels are so wide that a person could swim through them. Um, so again, they are a species of baleen whale, meaning instead of hard teeth like we have or like killer whales have, um, they have baleen, which is a fibrous material that helps them filter foods. So essentially they take a huge cup of water, push that water out, their, uh, out of their mouth by their tongue. And then when that water passes through their baleen, small little animals such as krill and microscopic animals will be trapped in there. And that's how the whale gets their food. So my last planktivore is going to be a manta ray. So a manta ray has an average wingspan of about 22 feet and they can weigh as much as 3000 pounds. They are the largest species of ray and their habitat ranges, range includes our Gulf of Mexico. So there is actually a marine sanctuary off the coast of Texas that is actually teeming with baby manta ray. So we know that's a great environment for them and that is a spot in their um, growth to maturity, something like that. Um, so yeah, that is my presentation. I'll stop sharing now. Um, I hope that was fun and then I'll let us move on. <laughs> that was fun. I learned a lot. I hope everyone else learned a lot. Um, and now we will go to some questions. So if you have any questions for Lacey um, for, from her presentation, please type them in the Q&A or the chat. I can see both. So let me see. I have some questions from before. So I have a question from Jackson. How many eggs do copepods on average lay? I'm not certain. Uh, Dr. Blalock, do you want to weigh in on that question as well? Variable. Uh, sometimes a few, sometimes hundreds, and in some cases thousands. There you go. All of them. <laughs> and so we have another. Oh, I like this question. Why aren't manatees cows of the sea? <laughs> <laughs> so people do call manatees cows of the sea because they're huge like a cow and they just feed on seagrass all day long. So I would argue there's multiple types of cows of the sea. I wouldn't argue that manatees aren't because they're adorable. They look just like a cow. So <laughs> let's see other if there's any other questions, go ahead and type them. Let's see. I'm looking through the chat here. How many, Jackson asks, how many planktivores are there? So lots. many. <laughs> I do not have a real number for that, but lots. So all types of baleen whales, um, those huge manta rays that are so large, um, a couple types of sharks. So I mentioned the whale shark and the basking shark. 
Um, that's just to name a few. And there's several species of baleen whales that will filter out those microscopic organisms. So um, all depends on just the way an animal is made. And that just um, tells us what they feed on. So again, if they have teeth like a whale shark, they're gonna feed on big meaty things. And if they have um, very tiny little teeth or those baleen plates, they're gonna be filter feeders. So many, many species of um, filter feeding animals, planktivores. Okay, Manning has a question. Could a goby and scooter blenny be planktivores since they eat solely copepods? Yes, since they eat solely copepods, I would classify them as planktivores. So again, I mentioned that um, some species, uh, species of fish will grow to be very small. And so their mouth size is not very large to feed on very large things. So they will usually eat nothing but planktivores um, not planktivores. They will eat plankton, copepods, algae, very microscopic things like that. So I would say yes. All right. Thank you, Manning and Jackson for the questions. And if there are no other questions <laughs> about copepods, <laughs> Uh, we will move on to Dr. Reg Blaylock. Thank you so much, Dr. Blaylock, for joining us today. Um, Dr. Blaylock is a, a university professor, and he is also the assistant director of the Ta Thad Cochran Marine Aquaculture Center, also known as TC Mac, like Lacey was saying earlier. Um, so... Dr. Blalock, I am going to give you the floor and I need to make you a, a host so you can share your screen. So take it away. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> You should be able to see my screen now. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you all for taking the time to, to, to join us. And thank you, Lacey, for that excellent presentation. Um, we'll talk about some of the same things. Um, it's possible she's presented it much more elegantly than I will, but um, what I want us to do is uh, think about aquaculture kind of in a, 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 a big picture. Um, we'll start with this graph and you don't have to type an answer, uh, but I want you to think about what this graph is telling you. What is the major point that this graph makes. It is telling us that the human population is increasing rapidly and is projected to continue to do so well into the future. This presents us with a problem and that is how do we manage this many people? What, does th what problems does this many people create? Well, there are several. One, of course, is where are they all gonna live? <clears throat> the earth is a finite resource. Um, so where are we gonna put people as we continue to accumulate more people on the planet? And how are we going to feed them? Um, so with food, um, you know, when you talk about uh, you pe when people tell you, well, you need to eat this or that to grow big and strong and all of that, they're mostly talking about protein. And 
So that is the major, um, a major concern uh, of how we're going to provide enough protein for the number of humans on the planet. Where do we get protein? Well, we can get protein from vegetables uh, like beans um, and others. Um, we can get uh, protein from animal products such as eggs and cheese. But mostly we get protein from eating other animals. Typically, that includes cows, chickens, and pigs. Certainly that's true in the United States and, uh, and Western countries. <clears throat> And we get those by farming them. But farming, uh, particularly if we're looking at how we're going to increase production of cows, chickens, and pigs, um, creates some issues. As I said, you know, there's a finite resource. We only have so much land and so much water that we can use. And you know, there's a limit to the extent that we can expand farms because, well, most of us don't want a pig farm in our backyards. Um, <clears throat> increased farming comes with increased pollution because we have to uh, get rid of the wastes from the animals. Uh, and we all face the challenges of climate change and how that's going to change uh, what we can grow. Um, whether it's corn uh, or uh, even animals to, 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 to some extent. If, if the weather gets too hot, too dry, um, it becomes a, a, a challenge. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> There is another source of protein though. Who doesn't like a good plate of uh, fried shrimp or a shrimp and crab boil or an oyster po' boy? Some of us even like uh, oysters and sushi. So fish, seafood is another source of protein. But there's a difference here. And, and in fact, there are lots of places in the world where seafood or fish products is the primary source of, of proteins for humans. But there's a difference here. Where do we get seafood? Well, we go out and we catch it, right? We live here on the, on, on the, the Gulf Coast and we can go out and catch shrimp and fish and, and, um, and feed ourselves. Uh, we do quite well. But there's a problem. And if you look at this graph, and if you look at the orange part of the graph, you'll see that we're not producing any more fish from the ocean, any more capture, captured fish from the ocean now than we were in 1985. We're simply harvesting out all that we can harvest from the ocean. And the only way we're going to be able to feed people with fish, fisheries products is through aquaculture. And as Lacey pointed out, um, about 50% of the seafood products in the world now come from aquaculture and it's going to continue to grow. Because if you look at the blue part of this graph, you will see that that slope is not leveling off at all. And if, you're to project, if you were to project it forward, it would continue to grow. So aquaculture, farming in the water, we've already talked about that. 
it includes fish, shellfish, and uh, plants. Uh, whether or not you realize it, you um, uh, are all uh, probably in some way associated with uh, products that come from seaweed and algae that are harvested and, and processed into products that, uh, that we use every day. Um, so we're dependent uh, on aquaculture. But there's another reason other than the simple fact of feeding people um, that aquaculture is an attractive thing to, 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 uh, to consider. And that's, if you look at this graph, <clears throat> you can see that fish are much more efficient in converting feed to flesh than either beef, pork, or chicken. For every 100 pounds of food that you feed to cows, you only get about 10 pounds of flesh produced. Slightly higher for pork and a little, a little bit higher for chicken, you're getting up to 20% there. But for every 100 pounds of feed that you feed to fish, you get 60 pounds of flesh returned. That's a huge difference. So fish are much more efficient and therefore cheaper to produce than beef, pork, or chicken. And so if you're looking to cheaply and efficiently produce protein, fish is uh, a good way uh, to do it. And there's some uh, that are even, there's uh, some that are even higher than, uh, uh, than 60%, but um, still very efficient and relatively cheap. So um, I have a very sensitive mouse here, so bear with me. <laughs> um, so if we're gonna do aqu aquaculture, uh, we need to have an idea, we should think about what aquaculture is and what it looks like. Uh, the goal, of course, is to harvest uh, fish uh, or shrimp or wh whatever you're growing out in large numbers. <clears throat> but you harvest it from a huge variety of, um, um, a huge variety of, from a huge variety of formats. Uh, ponds. Ponds are used to produce shrimp, catfish, uh, things of that nature. Uh, net pens, which uh, we mentioned, uh, Lacey mentioned earlier, uh, salmon uh, are commonly produced in net pens. Um, and then uh, there are all kinds of other uh, formulations like this flying saucer kind of looking thing that uh, uh, that you can put fish into um, in, in, in the open ocean, um, tanks uh, inside buildings. Uh, and if you think about oysters and things like that, um, you know, there are cages uh, that you can put the oysters in like is shown here. Uh, and uh, even you know, what we do here uh, in, in, in Mississippi is we manage oyster reefs in the wild um, so that we can uh, provide a place for uh, young oysters to settle and grow up so we can go back and harvest them. So there are a lot of different systems that you can use to produce, uh, 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 to produce fish. Um, <clears throat> and um, most of this uh, is for human consumption, of course, but there is another thing that we'll talk about in a minute uh, that's, a, uh, that's not necessarily related to, to human, uh, human consumption. Uh, at USM, we do aquaculture in tanks. Uh, and that requires a lot of equipment um, to, uh, uh, to make it work. And we call this recirculating aquaculture. 
and it basically operates, we're basically operating big industrial sized home aquaria. Now, many of you may have home aquaria, uh, so you can uh, follow along uh, as, I, as I talk about this, um, but in home aquaria, you fill it with water um, and sometimes, sometime later you put fish in it, but you rarely have to change that water. So you're continuously reusing that water. Um, and so, you know, water uh, being a valuable resource and particularly salt water, um, you don't want to lose it. So you want to reuse it, which means you have to have filtration you have to manage the quality of that water. Uh, and of course, you have to manage the temperature. Um, you also have to manage the amount of oxygen in the water because all of these animals that live in the water require oxygen. Now, we live in the air, in, in, and oxygen is not a problem for us because uh, air contains about 21% oxygen. Uh, so if you're farming cows or, or, or chickens, you never have to worry about them getting enough air. They're always gonna, there's always going to be enough air for them. Uh, and you may have to worry about the temperature of that air, but there's always going to be enough oxygen in that air. But in the water, water contains less than 0.1% oxygen or air. I mean, water itself is made up of oxygen, but that oxygen is not available for, for, for animals to breathe. So dissolved oxygen uh, constitutes less than 0.1% of, um, uh, of, of water. And so it's a limiting factor. You have to do things like include air stones to, to bubble air into the water so that the oxygen in that air can diffuse into the water so that the animals can use it. <clears throat> you can also inject oxygen directly. Um, <clears throat> and that becomes important uh, when you think about the number of animals that, uh, uh, that you have to grow um, in order for uh, you to, you know, for aquaculture to be a, a, a source of, you know, commercial production. Uh, you know, if you're a farmer, you can't just grow a few stalks of corn. You got to grow huge fields of corn. And the same is true with aquaculture. You have to grow a lot of animals in a relatively small space in order for it to be a viable business, which means that you're going to have trouble uh, maintaining that water quality. The other thing is you have to be able, you have to have a, a, a filtration that's going to, to, to manage the wastes in that water. Um, <clears throat> when you put food in there, not all of it's gonna be eaten. Some of it's gonna settle to the bottom, but if it is eaten, uh, the animals are gonna produce feces. Uh, you have to be able to uh, get rid of that solid material. And there are um, filtration, uh, uh, there are filters that will do that. Um, <clears throat> we call those uh, particle filters. Uh, and you can see an example of one here in the, the corner. I need to move. On. I've got, there we go, need to move some graphics out of the way. Uh, so here in the corner, um, this is a particle filter and it's basically a bed of, 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 of uh, beads, plastic beads in this case, that you run the water through and those particles are trapped. They can't flow through this, uh, this bed of, of, of beads, and so you can then remove them. Um, <clears throat> the other issue is liquid waste. Uh, the, the, um, 
the products of breaking down proteins uh, produce, uh, in, in the case of fish, ammonia, and that ammonia is dissolved in the water. The particle filter can't take that out. So you have to have another process to get rid of that. Uh, and that we do in what we call a, a, a bioreactor. Uh, and in that bioreactor, uh, you have more plastic beads, though it can be any number of things, that provides a surface for bacteria to grow. And those bacteria uh, are what will uh, consume that ammonia uh, and detoxify it so that you uh, can return uh, fresh, clean water back to your tank and not poison your fish with their, their waste products. So all of aquaculture and, and even home aquaria have to deal with these issues. It's just that in aquaculture, you are growing so many animals that you have to have some way of doing that uh, that's uh, a little more uh, advanced than what you can do in, in a home aquarium. If you're doing it in ponds, if you're doing aquaculture in ponds, you just simply pump in large volumes of, 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 of clean water and then pump out the, the, the dirty water. Uh, <clears throat> that's a problem um, that uh, it creates some environmental issues um, and so recirculating aquaculture gets around that sort of thing because we have all of these filters that will, um, that will clean that water and allow us to reuse it. And so this is what we do at USM. And our idea is that we take adult fish, um, capture them, put them in tanks, uh, condition them uh, to, to spawn in tanks. We then collect the eggs and sperm that, or the, if, that those uh, adult fish produce. And these are very small. Uh, <clears throat> marine fish produce extremely small eggs, less than a millimeter in size. Now, I know that all of you have studied the, the, the metric system, so you probably have some idea of what a millimeter is, but in case you don't, um, you all know what an inch is. There are about 25 millimeters in an inch. So these eggs are incredibly small. <clears throat> when they hatch, um, they're also small. Uh, and very soon after they hatch, they have to start eating because they have no uh, food reserves to speak of. Um, and so they have to uh, start eating very quickly. And this is where the copepods come in. <clears throat> All Marine fish require some sort of live feed. They have to eat live animals because they're designed to pick out movement in the water and designed to hunt prey. Uh, and so uh, they, um, they have to have something live. And, and, and copepods are what they eat in nature. Uh, the problem is that in hatcheries, copepods are difficult to produce. Uh, so we uh, use copepods where necessary, uh, but for some species of fish, they do quite well eating other uh, types of zooplankton like rotifers, which are also very small uh, uh, animals but they have to have something small to eat. Uh, and they grow um, fairly quickly, depending on um, 
the, the species. Um, you can barely see them when they're a day or two old, uh, but by the time they're 15 days old, they look like a fish, right? Um, and um, if you look at a tank full of, of, of these fish that are, you know, 10, 12 days old, <clears throat> you can see that we have a lot of fish in a tank. Um, and this is a little bit different than what happens in the wild. Um, you know, fish produce large numbers of eggs. Um, you know, some fish, uh, can easily produce a, a couple of million eggs uh, every uh, uh, every two or three weeks. So they produce this large number of eggs, of small eggs, but in the wild, very few of those survive. Um, <clears throat> and if you think about it, uh, and if you think about it in the context of the pandemic that we're undergoing right now, an individual, an individual fish only has to have one offspring survive in order for the population to be stable. It only has to replace itself. If it replaces more than itself, the population grows. If it fails to replace itself, the population declines. The same is true with transmission of the coronavirus. If every person that's infected with the coronavirus infects one other person, then the population, the inf population of people infected with that virus stays the same. If every person infects more than one person, the number of people infected with the virus with the virus grows. If every person fails to infect another person, then the population of infected people drops. And that's all what we're trying to get to with the coronavirus. But in marine fish, um, most of the eggs that are produced don't survive because um, those eggs are important resources for other animals to eat. Um, in aquaculture tanks, we don't have other animals in there to eat these, these fish, so we can grow large numbers of them in small spaces. And many more of them survive than would be in, in, in the wild. And again, if you think back to cows or chickens, if you're gonna lose 90% of the chickens you produce by something eating them, um, it's gonna be hard to make a living growing chickens and cows. Same is true with fish. Eventually, our goal is to produce a fish that approxi looks approximately like this. Now, this is a spotted sea trout. Um, but if we can produce them to this size, then we have two choices. We can take that fish and put it into tanks and continue to grow it to produce them for food. Or we can take this fish and release it into the wild to help support the, popu the, the population of wild sea trout that's out there. That's called stock enhancement. And we historically have done a lot of stock enhancement work uh, at uh, USM. And so most of the pictures that I'll show you from here on are really about stock enhancement, though many of the same things that I'm showing you would definitely apply to putting this, what we would do if we put this fish into a tank to grow it out to a commercial size that could be harvested and used to feed humans. To do that, we have to do a lot of things, uh, including fishing. I said we get our, uh, our adult fish from the wild. So we have to go out and catch fish. And I mean, 
who wouldn't enjoy spending a day to catch a fish looking like this? Um, so we, we do a lot of things like that. But when we catch them, we have to do a number of things to them. We have to take samples to make sure they're healthy. We have to treat them to make sure they will spawn in tanks. Uh, and when we put them into tanks, we have to do all of those things that uh, uh, I mentioned in terms of maintaining water quality uh, and feeding them. Uh, and then when it comes time to spawn, we have to get the eggs from them. Uh, and then we have to check the eggs to make sure they're, uh, they're fertilized and they're of the right quality to put them into tanks to let them hatch. Uh, and then get them into tanks where they where where where, where they can grow up to a, that that you know 15 millimeter couple inch inch or so size uh, that looks like a fish, and then we know what to do with them. Once they grow up to that palm size, we got to get them out of those tanks, and if we're going to release them. Um, we got to make sure that the ones that we release are identifiable because it's important for us to know what happens to those fish when they um, when they uh, when they leave uh, the lab. Um, and so uh, I'm missing a picture there. That's interesting. Uh, and so we put, again, there we go. <clears throat> so we put what's called a coated wire tag in those fish, uh, which is a small piece of, uh, of metal that's etched with a, a series of numbers. And we inject that into the cheek of the fish so that we can go back out and catch those fish, recover this tag and read that number and know when and where that fish was released. And that gives us a way to study what these fish do in the wild after we release them, which is important if you wanna know how this fish is contributing to the wild population. <clears throat> And so we release them um, in various uh, spots uh, uh, around the coast, the Mississippi, um, through this, uh, uh, from this, from these kinds of tanks, through this kind of hose. Um, sometimes, um, depending on which species of fish we're working with, um, we uh, do this offshore. Uh, and um, so we haul the fish in, um, in these uh, containers, uh, hook this hose to it, and put the hose down where we want the fish to go, um, pull a little trap, and it basically acts like a giant toilet, and you just flush them all out down into the ocean. Um, <clears throat> and so this uh, is a little bit about uh, the way we do aquaculture uh, at USM. Uh, we, as I say, we also do commercial, uh, commercially oriented stuff, um, but that's a lot of just fish in tanks uh, and doesn't show you uh, as much about the kind of activities that, that are associated with that. Um, so I didn't focus a lot on that. Um, but as Lacey also pointed out, we do lots of other things besides fish, including oysters, crabs, and shrimp. Uh, I work mostly with fish, uh, so most of my pictures are associated with fish. But um, um, if you have questions about oysters, crabs, and shrimp, I'd be glad to, to, to talk about that. So why? I mean, we talked about why aquaculture is important, uh, but why would you want to be thinking about aquaculture as, as, as a career? Well, there are several reasons. Um, 
Aquaculture is the fasting gro fastest growing segment of food production in the world. It's growing at a much faster rate than um, any plants or animal, animal agriculture at the moment. Um, the United States is behind on that. So I think there are going to be huge opportunities in the United States going forward because we got a lot of ground to make up. Um, and uh, so I think there are going to be lots of opportunities in the future. Uh, you can make a living doing this. Um, and, you know, it's work that requires you to deal with lots of different kinds of animals. Um, and it requires lots of different kinds of skills. You know, we need people that are good at math. We need people that are good at plumbing. Uh, you notice lots of pipes in those pictures that I showed you. So we need lots of people good at plumbing. We need people good at writing uh, because we do lots of presentations and publications. Uh, we need people that are good with chemistry. Uh, we need people that are good uh, in lots of different areas of expertise. Uh, and we need people with all kinds of personalities uh, because, you know, if you like to work alone, fine. We have lots of things that require people to, to, to work by themselves at all hours of the day. If you like to work in groups, we got lots of things that allow you to work uh, uh, with groups of other people, except not right now. Um, so, uh, you know, there are lots of advantages to, to, um, to careers in aquaculture. Now, to be honest with you, um, I didn't know that I wanted a career in aquaculture until I was well into graduate school. <clears throat> uh, that's okay. Uh, you don't have to know what you're doing, going to want to do, uh, right off the bat. Um, but it just kind of grew on me over the years as I learned that uh, um, how important it was and how interesting and how uh, as I developed uh, my real interest, which happens to be in diseases. Um, my training is in uh, uh, fish diseases and epidemiology. Um, and so as I learned that, I learned how important aquaculture was and how important diseases in aquaculture were. And so that's how I got into to, to, to aquaculture over, over the years. Um, so it's okay if you don't know what you want to do. Um, you got time to think about it uh, and work your way into, in, into something that, that, that's going to be a, a, a good career. Um, and so with that, I will end and thank um, Kelly Lucas, who is the director of the uh, Thad Cochran uh, Marine Aquaculture Center, and all of the staff that uh, works hard to uh, make sure we uh, accomplish everything we set out to do, and helped me with uh, you know, taking some of these pictures. Um, so I'll end with that and thank all of you for listening and take any questions. All right, Dr. Blalock, we have a couple of questions here. Oh, I just lost them. Oh, here they are. Okay, so we have a question from Manning. Yes, do you all do any coral aquaculture? We do not. Um, there are places uh, in the United States that do coral aquaculture. Um, <clears throat> Harbor Branch uh, Oceanographic Institution in Florida uh, does coral. Um, but we don't currently do that. Okay, we have another question from Sandra. If we fish in the Mississippi Gulf Coast and catch any of the types of fish mentioned earlier, should we check to see if the fish we catch are tagged? 
Well, with the tags that we use, uh, you would not be able to detect that. Uh, we would have to detect it. Um, and uh, when we were, we haven't released um, a large number of tagged fish over the last uh, few years. Uh, that part of our project uh, ended, um, but when we were doing that, yes, we were coordinating with fishermen uh, to, uh, to look at their fish to see if they had a, a, a tag. The likelihood of you having a tagged fish now, pretty low, uh, not impossible, uh, but um, uh, pretty low. Um, but the tags that we use, uh, we have, they're not externally visible. Uh, we have a special detector uh, for that. Um, I know that there are other departments within the research lab in the university that do want you to call if you find something that's tagged. So if the tag is big enough for you to see, you definitely want to call that number. Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Um, Jerry wants to know, is striped bass aquaculture still going on at GCRL? <clears throat> no. Um, that program ended several years ago, uh, but uh, if you catch a striped bass uh, in Mississippi waters, uh, it's almost certainly to have come from GCRL. And let's see, who asked this? Jackson wants to know what's your favorite part of aquaculture? Well, I like uh, the fact that it's never boring. It's something new and different every day. Uh, so I never know um, what's going to happen when I go when I go to work. I mean, I know that well. We're going to we're going to harvest a tank of fish today, but um, I never know what might pop up when we're harvesting that 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 tank of fish and uh, it turn out to be. Um, doing something totally different that day. Uh, so it's not boring. And I have, I think we have one more question. Dr. Blaylock, could you talk about Mississippi's oyster aquaculture for just a minute? Growing our own oysters is young and growing in the state of Mississippi. Yes, uh, the state of Mississippi is investing um, a lot of effort into uh, oyster aquaculture uh, because the, the natural populations of oysters are uh, declining uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, and oysters have historically been a very important industry in the, and, and so we're interested in trying to support uh, that industry and develop that industry and do and 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 do it as a, a, a way of providing economic development. Um, you know, if we have people farming oysters, we're helping provide jobs for people. Um, so you know that's one of the one of the primary goals of our aquaculture program is to develop the technology that the private sector can use to grow businesses and provide uh, employment opportunities for people uh, in Mississippi. Okay, so I do have one more question, uh, which will lead us into something else, but uh, so I'll let Lacey and Dr. Blaylock answer this. What type of degrees are needed for a job in aquaculture? So Lacey made me, she doesn't work in aquaculture at the moment, but she has a marine biology degree. But just like Dr. Blaylock was saying, they need plumbers and they need electricians. And um, so I'll let you guys talk about that for a little bit and then we'll wrap up. Uh, I would personally say any type of environmental sciences degree would be extremely helpful in the aquaculture field, but I'm not 100%, you know, um, familiar with all types of degrees and paths to get to aquaculture. So Dr. Blaylock definitely has more insight than that than me. Well, you know, so we, um, 
require um, some combination of degree and experience for almost all of our uh, positions. Now, you know, as a student, uh, at, 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 you know, that's, that's different. If you're uh, coming in wanting to do a graduate degree uh, in, uh, in aquaculture, you have to have a bachelor's degree typically in some kind of uh, uh, biologically oriented, science oriented field. Um, it could be chemistry or, or, or but, um, some kind of science field. But for em just employment, um, it's some kind of, some combination of degree and experience. Um, and uh, it can be as, when I say degree, it can be, you know, some kind of training program from, uh, uh, from um, a, a community college and, you know, to be an electrician or uh, something like that, um, that, um, you know, fits with whatever position we, we might be advertising. You don't necessarily have to be, have, have a master's degree or, or advanced training. Uh, we have, we do a lot of training in the positions that, 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 that we hire for. So, you know, it depends on what position uh, as to what degree and, 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 and what, uh, what experience will, will be required. But certainly, you don't have to have advanced, um, uh, necessarily have to have advanced training for an entry level position. And you could, I mean, at USM currently, you can do a marine science degree, marine biology, oceanography, um, lots of different programs to check out. Um, so that pretty much wraps it up. Thank you so much, Dr. Blaylock. Thank you, Lacey, um, for talking today. I did promise that um, I was going to tell you guys about our virtual summer camps. So we uh, keep a lookout on social media for those. We're gonna have two camps, I think, uh, as of right now, Backyard Biology for grades first through six, and then Blue Planet Careers in Ocean Science for grades seven through 12. So keep a lookout on our website, uh, social media pages, um, and then this particular talk is gonna be uploaded to our website as well as a pack of package of materials for teachers to use to teach copepods in the classroom. So thank you guys uh, for everything today. And um, I hope you all enjoyed it and learned a lot about copepods and aquaculture because I know I did. And we're gonna close it out. So. Thank you guys. Thanks everyone. Y'all. Bye.